here, but uh, thank you for all you guys have done, Andy and Libby, for investing in me, for believing in us, believing in the dream of Relevant Life Church before it even existed. They were some of our biggest cheerleaders. Uh, she, she'd get on the phone and go, honey, what do you need? What do you need? And, uh, and so I'm just so grateful. Prayer warriors, our church is what it is because of your guys' love and faithfulness, and thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I want to jump into week three of the Blessed Life series, and we're finishing this series this week, and we're, we're, this, series, this, this sermon title is called Going All In, Going All In. Maybe you've watched some poker before. We know you've never played it before, right? Nobody does that here. Uh, but maybe you've watched poker, and, and you know when you got like a good hand, you see those guys just go all in. You see those girls put all the chips on the table, steel face, not, you know, got the sunglasses on, I'm, I'm all in. And, uh, and I kind of got that illustration as I was thinking about this, this sermon, this, as we finish, as we're, we're in this series about learning that it's actually more of a blessing to give than it is to receive. And, and the big idea of this series is that God is the one who defines what a blessed life is. God is the one that defines what a blessed life is. Our life is blessed when we place what God has entrusted us with into his hands. And in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Jesus is quoted, and, and it says that, that Jesus said that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. In the last couple of weeks, we've been working through this idea and this thought that, that it actually, when we say that we're blessed, I think that we kind of get that mixed up. A lot of times you hear the word blessing, and you think about all the things that you have, rather than thinking about what does it look like to give that away. What does it look like to take what God has given uh, to me and give it away? Give it to others, impact others with my generosity, impact, impact the local church with my generosity. As we talked about last week, by, by bringing the tithe, by bringing what God has entrusted us with and, and, and tithing. And I, I want to say something briefly before I move into more about what we're talking about this week. But last week we kind of felt this tension after the sermon. We felt, we talked to a couple different people about it. Um, and, and there were some of the comments where, Pastor, I would love to tithe, but I am just drowning financially. I'm in some financial crisis, and we, ha we have this, this amazing life group, uh, Dave Ramsey Financial Peace Series. Highly recommend that. We'll be doing another one of those next semester. But before we even do that, if you feel like I just need some next steps to, to kind of get out of my situation that I'm in, I need some help. I need some support. We believe that the local church should come along and support and empower and equip you to live the life that God wants you to live. We've got a workshop that's coming up on November 11th. If you're interested in that, like just how do, what's my next steps to get out of debt? What's my next steps for learning how to budget? How do I do that? Sign up on your Connect card. We'll send you some more info. You'll be hearing more about that later. The reason why that's an important announcement that I wanted you to hear from me is I feel like some of you need to be pastored in this area. Let us help you. Let us pastor you. There's no shame. There's no shame in that. God wants you to live a blessed life where you're consistently able to trust him and give him what you have. If there's anything that's, that's keeping you from being able to trust God, we want to help you deal with it, guys. We want to help empower you. And, and so as we're talking about going all in, as we're talking about putting everything on the table, I want us to think a little bit about how Jesus went all in for us. Jesus went all in. Do you know that he didn't hold anything back? He didn't hold anything back. And, and I'm so glad for that because what that means to me is that now I don't have to worry about living a life of perfection in order for God to be pleased with me. Jesus lived a life of perfection 
because he knew that I couldn't live a life of perfection, and he did what I couldn't do, and so that now when I go to God, I can have access to God's presence, to be in his midst, to, to have an, a fellowship with him, and, and because of that, God, God gave, because God gave it all, I can now give my all to him. But I gotta, if I can just be honest with you, it's sometimes hard to give my all to God. It's sometimes hard for me to go all in. Does anybody else here struggle sometimes on social media? I've got one person that struggles on social media. I don't know that this is going to be relevant than what I'm going to say. Sometimes you read something that someone wrote and judgment rises up in your heart. And you're like, dear God, no, don't type it. And you type it anyways. That happened to me this week, guys. I went all in on the wrong thing. Uh, I'm typing it, and Holy Spirit's like, don't do it. Don't do it. And I'm like, I just have to say it. Um, and it wasn't bad. It didn't get into this big, long debate. I don't do that. I don't do big, big long debates. But, and actually, the, what I said was in agreement with what the person was writing about. They said, they said, hey, don't you, don't you get annoyed when people say everything happens for a reason? And sometimes people will say everything happens for a reason, and their exegesis is wrong about it. Like, you know, that God's allowing you to go through some, like, terrible, awful thing, but really sometimes we're going through a terrible, awful thing because it's the work of our own hands. And so the, the comment that I made, guys, and this is a pastor confession, I need you not to judge me, but the, the comment that I made was that, yes, you know, sometimes we can say everything happens for a reason, but the reason why it happens is because we're idiots. Oh, someone like that, someone likes that, uh, you know, like, we, we make dumb decisions, and then we blame those decisions on God. Like, oh, like we, you know, like God's like, don't do that. Don't touch that. Or, hey, or you need to do this and you need to submit in this area. And you're like, oh, no, I think I'm going to do my own thing. And, and then, then it happens to where you do your own thing and then you're in this circumstance and then you're like, God, why am I in this situation? Anybody ever been there? I know I've been there. And then, then the Holy Spirit gently reminds you, if you would have listened two weeks ago, then we wouldn't be in this situation. But how many know that God's a good father? And even sometimes when we get ourselves in the situations that we're in, he helps us get out of them. Sometimes I think he lets us sit in those situations a little bit longer so that we can learn. But he's a good father. He's an incredible father. And, 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 and today this message, really the inspiration of this message is out of that heart that God wants to inspire his kids to go all in. To go all in, to leave nothing behind. To, to, and so what does that look like? How does this, how do we define going all in? The first is this, that going all in means giving God my whole heart. Have you ever gone after something wholeheartedly? I, I kind of am a wholehearted person, meaning like, I go after something, you know, anyone ever do this with essential oils? You can't just have like four. You got to have like 15 of them or 20 of them, right? All of a sudden you're telling your wife, honey, do you know that peppermint will relieve your stomach aches? She's like, who are you and what have you done with my husband? Um, you know, like you just go all in or like you go to the gym and you're just wholeheartedly there for the first two days. <laughs> right? I, I, I'm all about wholehearted two-day commitments, you know, but, but like, like you can just seem like just, and then sometimes situations arise or whatever, and it loses its new, newness, and God doesn't want it to, to lose our, he doesn't want us to lose the newness with him. He, he wants it to be all in, all the time, our whole heart. He wants our whole heart. He doesn't want half of our heart. He had an interaction. Jesus had an interaction with a, a guy about this subject. And this guy, sometimes we, we look at him and we say, oh, you know, this guy was kind of a clown. He, 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 we maybe judge this guy, but I actually think this guy, when he had this interaction with Jesus, he had a, he had a, a, a good heart, meaning he was sincerely trying to look like what it 
He was sincerely trying to figure out what did it look like to follow Jesus. And that's, what he, that's how this conversation starts. And you can go ahead and put that scripture up, Matthew 19. It says that, behold, a man came to Jesus saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, what do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter et- eternal life, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And the guy says, which one's Jesus? And Jesus says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shouldn't steal, don't lie, honor your parents, and you should love your neighbor above yourself. And the young man says, I've done all these things, what do I lack? Jesus said to him, if if you want to be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. This is very important. This is the other thing that he tells this man. And come follow me. Come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Now, I don't think that it's just that he was sorry that he had to give those things up. What I think that he was sorry about was that he was not willing to give those things up. So what I mean by that is Jesus didn't just tell him, and sometimes if you're like me, you've read this account before, and you're like, oh, man, like, like God, you know, that, that was an idol in his life, and, and uh, yeah, that money, that money was a problem. And no, 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 no. That's not what, Jesus didn't say your money is a problem. He said your money has a higher place of affection than I do. See, our hearts are the place, it's the seat of our will. It's the seat of our affection. It's where we make our most important decisions. And God says, I love you so much, and I'm jealous for you so much, that I don't want anything else in that place of decision. I don't want anything else in that seat of decision that's going to influence you in a way that you're going to put something else above me and my plan for your life. In this case, it happened to be his wealth. But the issue wasn't just his wealth. The issue was that he wouldn't follow Jesus. Because the guy, he didn't, Jesus didn't just tell him, take care of that money, deal with your money. He says, hey, do these things first and then follow me. The issue was that he wasn't willing to pay the cost. It was, he was half-heartedly going after God. Now, on the surface, I think if you were like me and you're looking at this guy, he's got a pretty impressive resume. He says that he has never, you know, broken these commandments, he's loved his neighbor as himself, he's honoring his parents, he's done all these things. In one version it says, I've kept all these things even since a young age. He's done all these things. His resume is impressive, but Jesus says this one thing. Why? Because that, your whole heart isn't mine. Your whole heart isn't mine. And it isn't a matter of whether or not you'll be accepted. I think God accepts and loves and cares for people whose heart aren't there. I mean, the scripture says that God rains blessing on the just and the unjust. It's not a matter of whether or not God loves or cares for that person because of what they do. It's a matter of that person can't fully enter into this blessed life because they're not willing to go after Jesus with their whole heart. I don't want to be that guy. And if I'm super honest with you, I have been that guy. There's things that I've looked at. There's parts where I've held back. There's places that I haven't gone wholeheartedly. I just want to go all in today, and I hope you'll go with me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me with all your heart. Another translation says, if you seek with me, if you seek me with all your heart. Man, I've seeked after so many things wholeheartedly that did not lead to any internal, eternal impact. I've seeked after things that were temporal. I've seeked after things that didn't really bring fulfillment. Might have been brought a temporary satisfaction, but it didn't really satisfy my soul. I want to go after God wholeheartedly. I want to find him. Anybody else want to find God today? I want to find him. 
I want to find him. The second thing about going all in is going all in will cost me something. And I read this passage of scripture our first week. I just read one verse from it, but I think it's important that we read the context of it. If you brought your Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel 24. Click on your iPhone or your Samsung or whatever, but also you can follow along up here. 2 Samuel 24 Verses 21 through 25, I want to give you a little context before we jump in. David has just committed, uh, he sinned against God. He, uh, took a con- he took a census of his army. He wanted to find out how many people were in his army. And the reason why this was a bad thing is because God told him not to do it. His counsel told him not to do it. His friends, the army general, the guy that was in charge of it said, don't do it. And David did it anyways. And why this was a big deal was God was like, you know, he was like, you need to trust me, not the strength of your army. Why are you doing this? Why are you putting your affection on that? You need to not worry about that and let me be in charge of your life and in charge of your armies. And he still did it. And so after he did it, there was going to be some judgment that came, three different things that could have potentially happened. Instead of making a decision of what would have happened, he just said, I'm going to give myself to the mercy of God. And this is where we pick up at the story. He's determined that he was going to bring a sacrifice to God. And so he's looking for the place that he could offer the sacrifice, and he's looking for the sacrifice itself. And that's where we pick up in this scripture. It says, Arana said, my, why, my Lord, the king has come to his servant, David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. And then Arna said to David, let my Lord, the king, take and offer what seems good to him. Here the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen to the wood. And this, O king, Arana gives to you, the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Arana, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea of the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Interesting fact about this, that's where the temple was built. That's where Solomon built the temple, was in this place where David cried out to mercy. David had committed a sin, and he cried out and said, Lord, would you have mercy on my people? I've made a wrong decision. But he didn't. Do you know that it was within his power to be able to take these things from that guy because he's a king. Imagine if someone that you really look up to that was highly influential came into your house and said, dude, I want the chicken in your fridge, or I want, hey, actually, you know what, could you give me that car out there? Like, I need to use your car, and you're like, you know what, dude, you can just have it. If Michael Jordan came over, it might change things, right? If Kirk Cousins came to your house, if Carson Wentz came to your house, or whoever you're, you know, whoever it is for you, I don't know who it is for you, some of those people would be like, dude, here's my car, bro, go for it. Carson, I can tell people that I gave you my car, like, woo. Carson's driving my ride. Anyways, he could have done that, but he didn't. Why? Because he didn't want to offer up to God what cost him something, nothing. Can I ask you this question? When was the last time that you sacrificed in a way that really cost you something? I mean, like, maybe it cost you your pride where you had to humble yourself and apologize for something or maybe it cost you a relationship that God said for you to get out of because it wasn't life-giving or beneficial to you. Maybe it cost you a financial sum that was way more than you were anticipating or maybe it was it cost you some comfort because God said to you to, to speak to your mom about something that you haven't shared about or, or, or to your neighbor for sharing the, the gospel. Like when was the last time your sacrifice cost you something? Sometimes I think that we, we get, like, caught up in the, uh, what it's going to cost me, and, and you know what, or, or what's going to happen when I pay the cost. 
And I just want to say this, that I can't control the results of the cost. I can't control what's going to happen when I give my all. But I can control what I bring. I can't control the results, but I can control what I bring. I can do my best. Jesus, you are worthy of my best. You are worthy of my best. Sometimes I think we get like, oh, you know what? Jesus paid it all. He did. He paid it all. Therefore, I should give my best. I should give my best in response to what he did. He didn't hold anything back. He was all in because he loves us and he cares for us and he's passionate about us. Do we love him? Do we care for him? Are we passionate enough about it for us to be able to respond to that gift and give it all? Give it all. Hold nothing back. Jesus wants us to go all in. That's the second one is going all in means holding nothing back. Means holding nothing back. Check out the scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings to us so closely. I just want you to pay attention to that part. It says that it's easy for those things to cling to you. It's easy for those weights and those sinful things to cling to you. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Another scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 1. We have these promises, dear friends. Let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. This scripture kind of messes with me a little bit when I read it. And what I mean by that is like, okay, I thought I was cleansed in Jesus. So I thought that, that Jesus cleansed me, and, and, and he does. He does cleanse you. It's not one or the other. It's and and both. He cleanses you, and we cleanse ourselves. What, what does that mean, that, that word holiness? It doesn't have anything to do with your right standing with God. Your right standing with God has nothing to do with your efforts or your energy. Your right standing with God comes only from faith in Jesus Christ alone, period. But what this has to do with is my relationship with God because this word holiness means to be set apart, It's not my right standing with God. It's my relationship with God in the sense that there is nothing in my heart that's going to defile my relationship with him. There's nothing in my heart that's going to keep me straight away from my relationship with him. I have a part in that process. I'm the one that lets things in. I'm the one that's the gatekeeper, if you will, to my heart. Jesus wants to live there. He wants to be the source of my affections. He wants to be at that place of where he, everything that I filter in my heart comes from what is this, how is this going to influence my relationship with him. I think that the biggest thing that, that we've got to get past is this idea that means that I can kind of go after Jesus, but I can hold on to the things that I want to hold on to. God wants you to completely cleanse yourselves of everything that's keeping you from his best in in your life. Hebrews 10, 36 through 39 says it this way. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised for just in a little while. He who is coming will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I will take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Okay, can I just speak this over you? Can I just speak this over our church? We're not a church that shrinks back, guys. We're not. Here's the thing. 
This has been in our DNA from the beginning. It was the DNA before Relevant Life Church ever had services. We had the mentality, and God gave us this mentality, no matter the cost, no matter the t- what it takes, no matter the fight, no matter the battle, no matter the circumstances against us, no matter what's coming against us, no matter the spiritual forces that we're going to face, we will see this community transformed by the power and the love of God in Jesus' name. We are not a church that shrinks back. Dad, I want to ask you, do your kids see you shrinking back? Mom, do your kids see you fearing the things of this world and these circumstances more than they see you fearing and trusting God? Business owner, do you trust God with your business, with your resources? Student, are you trusting God? Are you going all in or are you shrinking back? Are you letting this society and this culture dictate your norms? Or are you letting the spirit of God inside you rise up above the culture and say, I'm a kingdom, I, I follow, I'm a kingdom kids, I follow kingdom principles, I live by faith, this world does not determine my standards, this world does not dictate my circumstances, I live by faith. I'm going after God with all I have. I'm going to hold nothing Back. I mean, I think if we did these things, can you imagine what your life would look like if you went after God with all your heart? If, if you stopped regarding the cost of, of what you're giving more than you're regarding the mission of what God's called out for you. If, if, if we stop just holding on to the things that are causing us destruction and keeping us from less than God's best, can you imagine what this community would look like if people did that in this city? Can you imagine what your home would look like if you went all in? I would love to see that. And you know what? God would love to see it too. There's this illustration that, that I heard it and it just like completely wrecked me it, 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 you know when 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 poachers a form of a way that they catch monkeys is they'll get these boxes and they'll put they'll be like a really heavy box that can't be moved and inside the box they'll put like fruit or food and the monkey will go in and they'll go to grab that fruit And they can't pull it out because the bars or whatever keep it from being able to pull the food out. And they just sit there trying to pull the food out. And meanwhile, the poacher will come with the sack and just throw it over the monkey and put him, tie him up. All because they wouldn't let go of that thing that's inside them. I think that's us. I think the enemy keeps punking us. Keep stealing our fruit, our joy. Keep stealing our seed for our offering, for our best. Keep stealing our affections. He keeps stealing things because we're holding on to temporal things that are destroying our lives. Some of us might be holding on to to being in control over our own choices, our entertainment choices, and they're they're destroying our lives. Some of us are maybe holding on to control uh, of, you know what, I want to look at a little porn on the internet. It's not going to hurt me too bad. Just holding on, holding on. Some of us might be holding on to just the spirit of control over our kids. I'm going to, they're going to do exactly what I say. Rather than inspiring them to, you know, to live differently. Some of us are in control of our finances in a way where we're not submitting to God. Where we're saying, you know what, I'm in Lord, I am Lord over my spending. I don't want to change it. And therefore we keep being put in the same situation over and over again. Some, some of us are in control to, to something, something that someone spoke over us. They might have said something about your destiny, and they said, you're not, you'll never rise above the level that you're at. And we're just holding on to that rather, rather than just trusting God, say, let go, let go. You're a king's kid. You're not subject to what that person said to you. You're not subject to what that person did to you. I'm greater than your pain. I'm greater than anything that anyone declared over you. Let that thing go. Come all in. What are you holding on to? What am I holding on to today that's keeping me from going all in? So the last thing that we're going to talk about 
It's our last next step. It's really one of them. Let's go all in. Today, as I'm talking, you might have, like, been thinking about something specifically that was preventing you from being able to go all in. And, and, and so I got this illustration that, that I want to use, you know, just the same one that I talked about at the beginning. And that's the, that's the poker illustration. So, guys, this might really mess with some religious people. But we used the tithe that we got last week to buy poker chips. <laughs> and if that really bothers you, you're in the wrong church. But I felt like I got this illustration. And, and uh, I kind of actually do enjoy watching on ESPN. They've got like these tournaments, these Texas Hold'em tournaments. And. And I kind of like watching the different players that are at those tournaments and, and how, they're, how they're playing. And, and there's different players that have different strengths. And, and some of them are, like, able to just, like, be, like, you know, no emotion. Some of them wear, like, glasses. Some of them are all, like, chatty to their opponent to kind of throw them off. Some of them are Minnesotan passive-aggressive to throw people off. Those are my favorite. Um, but inevitably, if you watch enough of it, at one point, you're going to see someone go all in. And a lot of times, you'll, they'll have one chip that's specifically designated as like their all-in chip. And they just throw that in. And it means that all their resources, everything that they have... It belongs to God, and so they'll go all in. And and I had I, I was thinking about this, and and how does this you know relate in our context into this sermon? And, and specifically, I was thinking about like I think that even we'll hear a message like this, or we'll read scripture, or we'll listen to a podcast, and and we'll say to ourselves like, yeah, we could do that, or or maybe we'll even for a season of time we'll be living this out where we're we're like fully surrendered and submitted, and and like things are going great, and and then we get off track. Anyone get off track? I, I get off track sometimes. And, and I thought about this that, you know, sometimes if when you're looking at poker, you're looking at people playing poker, they're doing their best to guess what's in their opponent's hand. I just want you and I to know this today. We, we might be holding back because we're afraid about what's in our opponent's hand. We're afraid of if we go all in, if we, if we trust God with everything, if we trust God with our time, money, our talents, our resources, our relationships, if we trust God with everything, we're afraid of what it's going to cost us. We're afraid of what life's going to look like. We're afraid of failing again. We're afraid of being vulnerable again. We're afraid of putting ourselves out there again. And you know what that is? That's our enemy, our opponent. You know what he's doing? Bluffing. You know what he's doing? He's trying to get you to hold your family back. He wants you to think that you can control more about the destiny of your family than God can. He's trying to get you to hold that wound back that God wants to bring you healing in. He's trying to get you to hold submission to your wife and your husband back in your relationship because you're afraid of what vulnerability looks like. He's trying to get you to hold back using your gifts and your purpose and your calling. He's trying to get you to hold back your resources to be an influence for his kingdom. He's trying to get you to hold back because he knows that what happens when a person is submitted to God, they can change the world. He's trying to get this church to hold back because what happens when a church, a group of people collectively goes after God can change this whole community. What are we holding back today? Let's pray. Jesus, we want to go all in today. Convinced of that. We want to go 
awe in. Before we can pray about that and deal with that, there's this issue of are we really following Jesus? Are we really, have we really allowed him to bring forgiveness and healing and restoration in our lives? We know that almost every week there's someone here that is yet to say yes to, to, say, to following Jesus, to, to accepting him as their Savior and Lord. So before we move on with the next part of our service, if that's you and you can, you can honestly say, I don't know Jesus. I'm not following him. I don't have a relationship with him. And I want to. I don't want to let anything be in the way anymore of my relationship with him and I want to follow him. If that's you, we're going to keep our eyes closed, our head bowed, or respect your privacy. But I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me today, Pastor. Awesome, I saw that hand. Anyone else? Yes, come on. Is there anyone else that would say yes to Jesus? You need to accept him or rededicate your life? Church, there's several here that have said yes to God today. Can we pray together? Just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice, for his love for me. I choose to follow him today. I confess all my sins and ask for forgiveness. I ask you to fill me with your righteousness and your purpose and your care and love for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? I just have one more thing to share before the team, the worship team sings. I feel like some of us today, we kind of get things mixed up. Just like I shared, we are afraid to give God our everything. And I just felt like I got this image in my mind, literally of this moment, of this, this illustration. And, and, and having the idea of, of fighting our battles. Sometimes we think it's about all this effort and work and energy and all these things that we have to do. And I think that it looks like more like this. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. We're going all in, church. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. We're giving it all to Jesus. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not letting anything get in the way of my destiny and my future that God has promised for me. I'm surrendering it all. I'm, I'm standing in his presence. I'm not outside looking in. I'm inside looking up for the provision of heaven, for the presence of God in my life. That's what it looks like to live a 